Hi friends, I welcome you all for the session. In this video, we are going to see the normal variants or the common pitfalls that we come across during fetal cardiac imaging. This video is based on this article and uh, this is a good one and I recommend all of you to go through it. In this slide, you can see two images showing four chamber of heart. In the first image, what is marked as LV is the left ventricle and the solid white arrow points to the moderator band. We all are very well aware of this fact. But however, sometimes this moderator band can mimic a cardiac tumor. Now coming to the next image, what we see as a structure mimicking moderator band is seen in the left ventricle. Now what is this? This is nothing but false tendon. This false tendon is a fibrous or fibromuscular bands that stretch across the left ventricle from the septum to the free wall and they can also tether to papillary muscle but they do not connect to the leaflets and they can be of various proportion too. They are clinically not much significant except that a few cases may cause arrhythmia. The first image is a apical four chamber view and the solid white arrow points towards the echo dropout which we commonly see if we take the food chamber exactly parallel to the race that is the intraventricular septum if it is aligned exactly parallel to the ultrasound beam then you may come across such echo dropouts this is also called pseudo vst so how to avoid this for that we have to take the food chamber in a slightly tilted manner or at an angle of 10 to 15 degrees where the ultrasound beam will fall perpendicular to the interventricular septum or exactly at the crux the rays will be perpendicular. So when we do like that or if we acquire an image similar to the second image then we can avoid this echo dropout. We saw how an echo dropout can be created in a apical four chamber view. In a similar way when we take left ventricular outflow tract view we can sometimes come across an echo dropout. Now, how to find out if it is a true one or a false one? First step is look for the site of the echo dropout in relation to the aortic valve. If it is above the level of aortic valve, it is unlikely to be a ventricular septal defect. If it is below, then there is a possibility it could be a perimembranous outflow VST. So in such cases, the next step would be to apply color and see if there is a bidirectional flow and assuming that the outflow tracts are of normal size. Still, if you have doubt and you are not sure about it, then after some time, try to acquire a apical four chamber view and try to get five chamber view and outflow tract. Seeing the LVOT view as similar to the third picture will help us exclude with confidence such pseudo echo dropouts. It is possible to find a linear structure in the atrium, especially in the third trimester in some fetuses lights. This is nothing but prominent tricuspid valve annulus and should not be mistaken for any pathology. When we see the first image of fourth chamber, we, we immediately get the suspicion of linear insertion of AV valves. So the next step would be to know whether it is the real one or a pitfall. So the next question is, which condition can mimic an AVST? It is dilated coronary sinus. It is a vein that collects deoxygenated blood from the heart and drains it into the right atrium and it is located most posteriorly between the left atrium and the left ventricle. It opens into right atrium and uh, drains the venous blood into the right atrium in between the opening of the IVC and tricuspid valve. In normal condition, it is very difficult to uh, visualize this coronary sinus. In cases of persistent left SVC and anomalous pulmonary venous drainage, coronary sinus is dilated. In those situations, visualization of the offsetting of AV valves might become difficult. So to avoid this, we should go more anteriorly to see the offset of AV valves. The first two images shows the normal coronary sinus. The last image shows us the dilated coronary sinus. Hypoechoic myocardium may sometimes mimic the pericardial effusion, but when you see the same thing in short axis view, 
where the hypoechoic area may continue into the interventricular septum, we can definitely distinguish this from the true fluid. In normal level of uh, pericardial fluid is 2 mm in the fetus and also that the normal pericardial fluid does not cross the level of AV valve. That is, they can be seen around the ventricle but not generally around the atrium. So, this is another clue to distinguish normal pericardial fluid from abnormal collection. In the first picture where you see the straight arrow is the position of the pulmonary valve. Distal to that where you see the curved arrow, there is a slight dilatation of the pulmonary artery. And this slight dilatation is seen especially when the right pulmonary artery is out of the imaging plane. So, slight alteration of the imaging plane will help us identify the bifurcation of the right pulmonary artery and ductus arteriosus. Furthermore, to exclude any stenosis, we can look for the aliasing with the appropriate setup of color and usage of pulse wave Doppler and the settings of which I have explained in the later slides. Here you can see an echogenic area in the left atrium. Identification of this will indirectly indicate normal drainage of left upper pulmonary vein and therefore excluding total anomalous pulmonary venous connection. We know that when we look at a valve, finding a thickened valve, doming of valve or any gradient present across the valve are all the direct signs of the valvular stenosis. But in the fetal life, it is not always possible to have these typical direct signs. So what next? Now we have to depend upon the indirect signs for suspecting valvular stenosis. First is the size of the uh, vessel can be small. We have to analyze the valve movement across ventricular systole and diastole. When the ventricle undergoes diastole, the seminolar valves are closed. And when the valves are closed, it will appear as an echogenic dot in the center of a great vessel. In the case of ventricular uh, systole, the valves will open and the leaflets of the valve will go and touch the walls of the great arteries and in those cases we will not be able to see the echogenic uh, dot in the center of the great vessel. This happens normally but whenever there is stenosis this echogenic dot in the center of the great vessel is present throughout both systole and diastole and that becomes the diagnostic clue for valvular stenosis. What's the role of forearm and mobile here? Whenever there is an increase in the pressure in the left ventricular outflow tract, this may indirectly increase the pressure in the left atrium. Increased pressure in left atrium will cause premature closure of the foramen mobile or restriction of the foramen mobile and this can be a clue for suspecting increased pressure in the left ventricular outflow tract. In such cases of restriction of foramen novel, we will have increased pulsality of uh, pulmonary veins. Uh, in fact, it will be seen very easily. So these are all the additional factors that we have to look at when we have a suspicion of valvular stenosis. Friends, I know that we all use color Doppler while doing fetal echo. However, the ideal uh, setup or velocity of the color to visualize the structures in a better way is what we are going to see in the slide. For example, to visualize pulmonary veins, you bring down the PRF to 20 to 40 or even you can use power Doppler or HD flow to get the pulmonary veins. If to visualize the interventricular septum, it is better to have the velocity in between 40 to 60 centimeter per second or otherwise we will have uh, the, we will pick up the movement of the wall also. And to assess the valvular stenosis, it is better to have the velocity between 60 to 80 centimeter per second. As a rule of thumb, any velocity up to 100 or consider normal and above 100 centimeter per second, we have to have a caution and above 120, it is diagnostic of valvular stenosis. Technically, how to get this is by adjusting the PRF. Whenever we are using pulse wave Doppler, it is important that we adjust three parameters. One is the gate size, the other one is amplitude of waves, and third one is the number of waves. Generally, it is preferable that you keep the gate size as 2 mm in first trimester, 2 to 3 mm in second trimester, and 3 to 4 mm in third trimester. Adjust the PRF such that the peak of the wave occupies two thirds of the scale. Also, we have to see to that the number of waves that occupies the frame 
should at least be 4 to 5 equal waves. This is the optimal method of using the pulse wave Doppler.